Well, welcome. Thank you all for coming. Our time today will be spent in Matthew chapter 23. But before we begin, let us stand together and sing hymn number 70, O Sacred Head, Now Wounded. Oh, you're not plugged in. Somebody's got it plugged in. Right there. Ooh, you know what? Oh, okay. You know what? We're not there. Extension cord. Extension cord. We got a union electrician in the house. <laughs> we can sing it a cappella. Oh, no, we got it. You got it. Yeah, sing it a cappella. A cappella. That's how they do in Mexico. That's <laughs> it. That's right. Okay, here, let's see. Now there it is. Now, now. Okay. Oh. Oh. Bibles to Matthew's Gospel and the 23rd chapter. <clears throat> Today we're going to be taking a look at verses 14 to 15. <clears throat> Matthew 23, 14 to 15. And actually, you might not have verse 14 in your Bible if you don't have a King James Version or a New King James Version. It is in the Textus Receptus. It is not in some of the earlier manuscripts, and so some translations don't have verse 14, or you might find it in the margins or the bottom of your Bible. Verse 14, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense you make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell 
as yourselves. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. So we gather together again today to take a look at the second and third woes that Jesus pronounces on the scribes and Pharisees during the last week of his earthly life and ministry. How bone-chilling these words should have been to Christ's listeners. How they should have fallen on their faces and begged the Lord, O oh Lord, what shall we do to be saved? That the Lord Jesus himself is making these pronouncements of woe. Saying things like, yours will be the greater condemnation. And the proselytes that you make are twice as much sons of hell as you are. Oh, that should have just caused them to melt. Caused their hearts to melt. To cry out in fear and trembling to ask God for mercy, but they don't do that. So far from repentance were they that Christ's preview and foretelling of their coming judgment only served to harden their hearts further against the Lord. I think that this is a crucial lesson for us. When the Bible says, that God's word does not return void, but accomplishes the purpose for which he sends it. There are people who take that verse to mean that God's word, the purpose of his word, is always to save. And that's not necessarily the case. Sometimes God uses his word as an instrument of hardening. As the saying goes, the same sun that melts the wax hardens the clay. And as the Lord sends forth his word, which accomplishes his purpose, we're going to see that his purpose, at least in some measure, in sending out this, this particular word here and the words in this particular chapter, served to be the impetus, or at least one of the impetuses of the Pharisees hatred of Jesus and their decision to ultimately murder him just a few days after he said these things as we go line by line through chapter 23 we can see why they felt so angry because their pride was pricked because these men of all people believed that they were righteous that they were good in God's sight. How dare this Jesus, who has no, no formal rabbinical training, he didn't go to the best schools, how dare he say to them that they are hell-bound, that they are sinners, that theirs is a greater condemnation. And God used this word to accomplish his ultimate purpose in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ for the salvation of the world. It's amazing how we see the, just ha having the whole Bible with us, in front of us, how we see the overarching umbrella plan of God's salvation, where in the moment, especially for the disciples, um, I don't know, if you were one of the disciples, and you didn't realize, even though Jesus had said it so many times, that he has to be ha handed over to wicked men, and crucified and die and on the third day rise again, even though he said that many times. If you're one of the disciples and you didn't really listen to that part of Jesus' teachings over and over and over and over, as Jesus is saying these things to the leaders of Israel, what are you going to be thinking? Uh-oh, <laughs> it's, it's not good. You know, don't say that, Jesus. Don't tell the people who are sitting on the Sanhedrin that theirs is the greater condemnation. They're liable to kill you. And what did Peter say to Jesus after his marvelous uh, confession of Christ? Who do you say I am? Peter says, you are the Christ, 
the son of the living God, Jesus says to Peter, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal these things to you, but my father who is in heaven. What a marvelous thing that is for Jesus to say. Peter had to be on top of the world as Jesus says that to him. Amazing. God the Father reveals something directly to Peter. Peter makes this confession of the Christ. Immediately after that, Jesus says, now I have to tell you what the Christ is going to have to do. He's going to suffer and be handed over to wicked men and be crucified and on the third day rise again. And in almost the same breath, Peter then says to Jesus, what? This shall never happen to you, Lord. <laughs> right? Why is that? Because Peter only had a partial understanding of what Jesus being the Christ meant. He only could see, only could understand, no one has ever done the type of things that Jesus is able to do. No one's ever fed 5,000 men with five loaves of bread and two fish. No one's ever raised the dead before like Jesus is able to. No one has ever done the things that he's able to do. He must be the Christ. Because I know he's shown that over and over. He walks on water. I've seen it. I even walked on water with him once, right? That's what Peter's thinking. And yet, he only had a partial understanding because he didn't realize that Jesus' purpose is plan in coming to the earth the first time was to die for the sins of the world. I was preaching on this earlier this morning, how the marvelous transformation of Peter, as we see in 1 Peter, the end of 1 Peter chapter 2, when he says he bore our sins in his body on the tree, and how Peter's understanding of Jesus was just transformed after the resurrection, after Pentecost. He suddenly has an understanding of who Christ is. Anyway, all that to say that as Jesus pronounces his woes on the leaders of Israel, they are true and they needed to hear these things. And at the same time, God used this truth ultimately to harden their hearts against the Christ so that they would kill him, so that we, even in this room, might be saved. It's amazing, actually. It's so profound how God works in the world, how he works through his providence. And there is a, a grave lesson here for us as well. <clears throat> Christ's words, his foretelling of judgment, served to harden the Pharisees' hearts even further against him. But how do we respond to the rebuke of the Lord? When we're reading the Bible and we see some way in which the Bible is exposing some particular sin that we're in the moment struggling with, how do we react to what God's word says to us. When we hear difficult words from the Lord that show us our sin and our depravity, do we submit ourselves under them and say, yes, these things are true of me, Lord. Search me out. Cleanse me from my impurity. Forgive me of my heinous sin. Enable me to live ever more wholeheartedly for you. Or do we do as the scribes and Pharisees, gritting our teeth in anger at the piercing sword of the word. Because the word is a sword. It does serve to pierce us. It's able to pierce us. I think of in John chapter 4, when Jesus says to the Samaritan woman, she, she says, give me this water. And then Jesus says to her, go call your husband. Oh, what a piercing sword that is from the Lord. Pierced right into her most sensitive issue that she's wrestling with. Her most sensitive place. And uh, even though we don't see intonation and inflection in the text, I think it's fair to say that when she replies and she says, I don't have any husband. 
that she didn't just say, oh, I don't have any husband. She probably said it like this. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have any husband. Because he touched that place. And then Jesus says to her, the truth is you've had five husbands and the man you're with right now is not your husband. What you said is true. Oh, snap. Okay, why did Jesus do that? Why? Why did he use the word as a sword to pierce that pus-filled sore in that woman? It's because that's what a doctor does, right? If you have, a, we have a dermatologist right here with us right now. If there's some pus-filled sore, what do you have to do? You have to pierce it, even though it's painful. Get all that junk out. That's what Jesus was doing with her. Bringing that sin issue right to light, showing her her most desperate need, that actually she was looking for her satisfaction in the wrong places, and she needed to look to Jesus Christ for that. But the word was painful. How did she react, though? She received it. Right? She received it, dropped her water jar, ran to the town, and she said, come meet a man who told me everything I ever did beautiful actually because all the people in the town knew everything she ever did they all knew it jesus knew it too even though he had never met her before she had never met him how do we react when we see the word of the lord piercing us oh i don't want to be like the pharisees it's actually quite easy especially for teachers of the word to fall into the pharisaical pit it's very easy for that and I can't, uh, I can't say, oh, that's a temptation that will never come to me. It's easy, especially, you know, you go to school for a long time and you get degrees and you, you're a professional expositor of the word to, to maybe think, you know, this is for other people and not for me. And I never want to be that way. A preacher always has to apply these things first to oneself as they're preparing the sermon and all of that. We need to guard our hearts. We need to take heed of Jesus' words that even though these are delivered to a group of people 2,000 years ago um, on the other side of the world, they have universal application. It's not, it's not as though the Pharisees were some different kind of sinners than other people. Lots of people can fall into the same temptations that they had. Look at verse 14 again, if you're able to. <laughs> if you're not, I'll read it for you. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense you make long prayers. Therefore you will receive greater condemnation. This verse is not in most of the earliest New Testament manuscripts. That's why ESV doesn't have it, NASB doesn't have it, NIV doesn't have it. However, it is in the Textus Receptus, which is the manuscript upon which the King James Version was translated. And so I will expound on it, uh, given the fact that the tenor of verse 14 is in line with all the other teaching of Jesus on this matter, okay? So whether or not uh, it is in the original or not, there are scholars that debate that fact, and there are some who have good arguments to say that it is, should be there, that just because a manuscript is earlier doesn't necessarily mean that it is better than a later one, um, especially in the places where some of the earlier manuscripts were found and so on. I'm not a King James Version only person, but I have to say that I think that without getting into some theological exposition of the, the uh, preservation of the text, there are things we can learn from the Textus Receptus in the King James Version of the Bible. And so I think it's important for us to know. Uh, verse 14, um, Jesus directs his second woe toward the scribes. And the Pharisees. Remember the first woe in verse 13. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. And then verse 14. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, 
because you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense you make long prayers. Therefore you will receive greater condemnation. So Jesus directs his second woe toward the scribes and Pharisees because they are hypocrites, he says, who devour widows' houses, and for a pretense, they make long prayers. Therefore, he says to them, you will receive a greater condemnation. Notice that it says that they make long prayers for a pretense. A pretense for what? Well, in this context, it seems that their long prayers were a pretense to enable them to devour widows' houses, right? What does that mean? Well, what the scribes and Pharisees would do is find financial supporters in widows who no longer had the natural protection of their husbands. And they would find these women who perhaps got some kind of an inheritance, a pittance, perhaps, of an inheritance, but an inheritance nonetheless, and they had no men in their homes, and the Pharisees and the scribes would go to them and say, oh, Mrs. So-and-so, we're so sorry to hear of your loss. Let me help you as you go through your finances, all right? I have a lot of experience in these areas, and you know what the Lord says, 10% is only the base level of what your giving should be. And so you really need to be giving more to the, I mean, you trust me, don't you? You see me praying out in the marketplaces and in the synagogue and in the temple. Oh yes, yes, I know you're a very holy person. I trust you. Why don't you just take all of this money and you handle it for me, Rabbi whoever? You handle it for me and, and take it, and, and I'll trust you with that. And Jesus, who knows everything, who knows the intention of the heart, he's saying about these people that they would give an air of spiritual superiority so as to convince vulnerable people, especially vulnerable women, to give them over their entire fortune, their entire amount of money to live on. And Jesus says about that, theirs is the greater condemnation for doing so. These men would do their best to impress these women with their seeming devotion to God, their public praying, and then persuade them to give all they had to the Lord's work that the Pharisees pretended to be doing. Albert Barnes, the 18th century American theologian, uh, wrote the, the following. You can find Barnes notes on the Bible. Um, they're actually really good. I, I've, I've always found a lot of help from Barnes. He wrote this. These people did this under the pretense of counseling them in the knowledge of the law and the management of their estates. Because the law actually talks about what widows are to do with their finances and how they should get remarried and so on. The kinsman redeemer, all of that. So if there wasn't a kinsman redeemer around, in other words, a man who was able to marry his brother's widow, then, you know, there weren't social programs at that time. They didn't have social security. They didn't have places where widows and poor people could go to and get supported by the Roman government. Roman government's not going to support them. They're going to let them starve to death and die. That's it. So where would people go to, especially Jewish women who were widows, who did not have a kinsman redeemer to come and rescue them out of their pitiful condition? Well, they would go to the synagogue. They would go to the trusted leaders and say, I don't know what to do with all of this. As a matter of fact, women in that time were fairly uneducated weren't able to hold jobs like men were, necessarily. So these people took advantage of the widow's ignorance and their unprotected estate and extorted large sums for their counsel or perverted the property for their own use. And so the Savior denounced them. If there is any sin 
of special enormity. It is that of taking advantage of the circumstances of the poor and the needy and the helpless to wrong them out of the pittance upon which they depend for the support of their families. And as God is the friend of the widow and the fatherless, it is expected that people who do that will be visited with heavy condemnation. Heavy. In the King James Version, at the end of verse 14, you have N NKJV, don't you, Calvin? Mm -hmm. What does it say at the end of verse 14? Do you have that there? Therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Does it say condemnation there? Yes. Oh, okay. It's NKJV, right? That's right. In the 1611 KJV, it says the word damnation. It's same, same word. We don't really use that word very much anymore. And all the modern translations will say condemnation. But there's something heavy about that word damnation. All right. King James Version, you will receive the greater damnation. Behold here. Look at what Jesus is actually saying. He says to these men, you, listen, imagine that Jesus is standing in front of you in the temple. He's in the temple. Okay. Now, how do I know he's in the temple? Because look at chapter 24, verse 1. Jesus left the temple. <laughs> All right. So he's saying these things inside of God's temple. Pharisees are there. There's a crowd of people that's there. Jesus is standing right in front of you. You are in the temple. And he says to you, this is King Jesus, you will receive the greater damnation. Wow. Wow. Look at the pronouncement of the judge ahead of the trial. He can do that. He can make the pronouncement ahead of the trial, because he knows the end from the beginning. How utterly terrifying these words are. Even the word terrifying is not terrifying enough. How unbelievably scary they are. Christ tells the scribes and Pharisees, not only will they receive damnation, but they will receive greater damnation. I'm reminded here of Hebrews 10, 26 to 27. If we deliberately go on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no further sacrifice for sin remains, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume all adversaries. And yet, these people whom Jesus is addressing, did not even have that fearful expectation of judgment. They did not. Though they should have. For not very long after Jesus made this pronouncement, perhaps only a few decades or a few years, the people to whom Jesus was talking were indeed barred from the gates of heaven when they died. And their fearful expectation of the coming judgment, though they did not have that at the time of Matthew 23, they have that right now. Right now. As they are waiting in Hades for the final judgment when death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire. Oh, for the last 2,000 years they've been there, waiting in Hades for a day which only the Lord knows when Christ will return and he will pronounce final judgment against the whole world. And they've been there in this temporary... Uh, this temporary place of torment awaiting the final torment in, in actual fearful expectation of it. Though they did not have it at the time, they have it now. How all of them, right in this moment, would wish 
that they had had fear of God, a true and reverent fear of God while they were living on the earth. How they all would wish right in this moment, oh, I wish I had taken Jesus' words seriously. I wish that I had repented and believed and trusted in him when he was standing right in front of me. How they may even remember Jesus' words as I'm saying them right now. I'm sure that they do. They have to be impressed upon those souls who are not in heaven, who heard him with their own ears, who watched him do the things that he did with their own eyes. And I truly pray that anyone within the sound of my voice right now will not die and a hundred years from now be thinking, I was listening to a pastor who was talking about this very thing, that judgment is coming. And there was a pastor who warned me and said to flee from the wrath which is to come. And I didn't listen. God forbid that there would be anyone like that who is hearing my voice in this moment. Look at verse 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourself. Wow, these are so, these verses are so heavy. Like, I, I love preaching the Bible. I love it. I love preaching all the Bible, any of the Bible. It makes salvation, when we see verses like this, it makes our salvation that much sweeter to see it against the backdrop of the condemnation that we ourselves deserve. Um, but there's also another part of me that's going to be happy when I get to Matthew 24 and talk about the stars falling from the heavens. <laughs> right? <laughs> Honestly. Woe to you, he says. This is a third woe. This woe is pronounced because of the zeal of the Pharisees in making proselytes to their own wicked practices. A proselyte was the person that came over from a foreign nation or religion or sect and converted to Judaism. So they were a convert, in other words. So these are people from other countries, the nations, who they heard about the God of Abraham and perhaps a Pharisee or a scribe traveled to some far off land and they told them about the truth of the Bible and these people said, ah, I want that. I want to leave my pagan practices and follow the God of the Bible. But guess who their teachers were? The Pharisees and the scribes, the very people that Jesus was condemning here in these verses. And far from leading the proselytes into the kingdom of God, what the Pharisees were doing is they were leading them into the wretched kingdom of the Pharisees, of Pharisaism, and turning them into even more sons of hell than the Pharisees themselves were. Jesus says that the Pharisees sought converts, but not to show them the way of righteousness. Hmm. I think that there's an application here to the church today, especially in the West, in America. Can you think of churches that seek converts, but not to show them the way of righteousness? They seek converts for either their own monetary gain or for numbers or for fame or for anything else but the actual gospel. And how do we know that? Because those churches don't actually preach the actual gospel. And so if you see some, I'm not even going to name, you already know in your own mind. I can already read your minds, okay? You already know. I don't even have to say them. There are churches like that even in our own area. 
It's like if the gospel is there, it's an afterthought. It's a secondary thing. The converts that they seek are converts to something else. And the reason that we know that is because the gospel is not central in their ministry. If they wanted to bring people to the gospel, then they would preach the gospel. But they want to bring them to something different than the gospel. And this is speaking to our day. And the Pharisees sought these kinds of people not to show them to Jesus, not to show them to the way, the, the way of God and God's, even God's law and practice, but rather to instruct them in their own perversion of the law and thus making them twice as much a son of hell. See, those proselytes were already sons of hell. They were already sons of hell, right? Why, why do I say that? Because Paul says, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. They didn't have to be made into sons of hell. That's what they already were. And then the Pharisees and scribes aim chiefly to bring them into their own special kind of hellish practice. Jesus says that these proselytes were twice as much sons of hell as the Pharisees because new converts are typically the most zealous, aren't they? These proselytes of the Pharisees wished to prove themselves to their rabbis on how well they could follow Pharisaical teaching. In other words, they wanted to outscribe the scribes and out-Pharisee the Pharisees. Oh, can you imagine how awful that would be? Like, we see the practices and the way that the Pharisees looked at Jesus and the way that they lived their lives, cleaning the outward man and inside they're full of dead men's bones. And now these people are teaching young converts to do the same thing as them? I don't know. I mean, I think we can see, uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that this is wrong in the Christian sense that a new convert is zealous for the Lord. There's some sense in which I'm, I'm, I miss the freshness of having learned the Bible for the first time. And, and there's, there's something better than that now in digging deeper into the Bible than just learning it for the first time. But, but if you remember like when you were first saved, if you weren't a child when you were, if you remember, at least for me, when the Lord first saved me, I couldn't, I couldn't get enough of the Bible. I wanted to go out every day on Devon Avenue and preach the gospel to people. Like nothing could hold me back. You know, I want, and, and I miss, I miss that in some sense. There's, Perhaps, hopefully, a little bit more maturity now in my life, but, but maturity sometimes replaces zeal a little bit. Yet these people were zealous for the wrong thing, see? They're new converts, but they're zealous for the wrong thing. They're zealous to prove their works. We see in verse 15, truly a picture of wasted life. Not just a picture of an evil life, a picture of wasted life. Look at even the zeal of the Pharisees themselves. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. Almost sounds like the Apostle Paul, doesn't it? <laughs> right? Travel across sea and land. And wouldn't we say about Paul, he's the most zealous of all of the apostles? That's right. Look at the zeal of them. Zeal, which was admired by men and yet was despised by God because it was zeal without knowledge. How this moment, they're in Hades, full of worldly sorrow over their condition. How, these, how they thought that they would be welcomed by God into heaven by their works, which ultimately turned out to be nothing more than filthy rags. And how they had the Lord Jesus Christ right in front of them, calling out to the weary and heavy laden to come to him and find rest, only to reject the cornerstone and stumble over it to their own destruction. God have mercy. God have mercy on us. May we never fall into the same pit as these men did. I want to show you for a moment something that 
at first glance might seem not to have much application to what we're referring to, but I think you'll see why it does. In Isaiah chapter 28, if you would turn back there. Isaiah chapter 28, and, uh, well, we'll start at verse 1. Isaiah writes, Ah, the proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim and the fading flower of its glorious beauty, which is on the head of the rich valley of those overcome with wine. So he's using this imagery of drunkenness and judgment, okay? I want you to skip down to verse 10. Just I wanted to give you that just so you could see, and if, some of you might have even in your Bible, uh, at the very top of verse 28, uh, of chapter 28, where it says judgment on Ephraim and judgment on Jerusalem specifically. Go to verse 10. For it is precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. For by people of strange lips and with a foreign tongue, the Lord will speak to this people to whom he has said, this is rest, give rest to the weary, and this is repose. Yet they would not hear. And the word of the Lord will be to them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little, that they may go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken, therefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scoffers who rule this people in Jerusalem. Because you have said, we've made a covenant with death and with Sheol we have an agreement. When the overwhelming whip passes through, it will not come to us. For we have made lies our refuge and in falsehood we have taken shelter. Okay, what is this? What is going on here? It's just interesting to me because this is, the context of Matthew 23 is at the end of Jesus' earthly life. Um, probably two days after Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So maybe four or five days before, maybe, maybe three days before the crucifixion. Okay. And then Jesus dies on the cross. He's raised from the dead on the third day. And then for 50 days until Pentecost, uh, or I should say 40 days, and then he is ascended into heaven, then Pentecost comes. What happens at Pentecost? The Holy Spirit descends upon the people and the disciples. And what do they first start doing right when the Holy Spirit descends upon them? They start speaking in foreign tongues. Right? That's what they're doing. They're speaking in foreign tongues. So that in Acts chapter 2, the people are listening to the disciples speaking in foreign tongues. And like Arabs are like, I'm hearing the mysteries of God proclaimed in my own language. Now, look at this text. It's amazing. As a sign of judgment against Jerusalem, the Lord says, by a people of strange lips... And with a foreign tongue, the Lord will speak to this people. Okay, how did God speak to his people? What language was it in from the time of Moses onward or before Moses, from the time of Abraham? What language was it in? Hebrew. Hebrew, the Hebrew language. The Bible is written in the Hebrew language, the Old Testament. God speaks in the language of Hebrew, to his people. And then he says that as a sign of his judgment, he is going to speak to his people in Jerusalem with foreign lips, a foreign tongue. People have strange lips and a strange tongue. Why? Why is he going to speak to people with foreign lips and in a strange tongue? He's going to do it. He'll speak to his people to whom he has said, this is rest. Give rest to the weary. This is repose. Yet they would not hear. Who said 
Come to me and you shall have rest for your souls. Jesus, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. If you come to me, you will have rest. And what does it say? Yet they would not hear. The rulers of Jerusalem would not hear him. Okay, so he's saying as a sign of judgment, people of strange lips and with a foreign tongue will speak to this people to whom he has said, this is rest, but they would not listen. Verse 13, and the word of the Lord will be to them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. In other words, the law itself will be the precepts which those under the law, which will condemn them for breaking it, that they may go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scoffers who rule this people in Jerusalem. Mm. Isaiah, the word of the Lord says to Isaiah that they've made lies their refuge and in falsehood they've taken shelter. So, why am I bringing that to you from Isaiah 28? Because the apostolic sign gift of tongues, the whole purpose of the sign gift of tongues is outlined for us in Isaiah 28. Isaiah tells us what the whole purpose of tongues was. It was to proclaim to those who had made lies their refuge, who had not listened to Jesus, in whom they could have found rest. It was to proclaim to those people that God's salvation has now gone to the nations because they rejected Christ. Because of these woes that Christ is proclaiming on the leaders of Israel. These woes. That's the reason why. That's what, let me just say, just, I know it's a little bit of a side note, but I think it's so, so important to know that, like, how on earth did large segments of the church today come to this idea that tongues is some babbling nonsense? How on earth did people come to that? I have no idea. It's not the case. It is not true. The Bible is clear about what the sign of tongues is for. It is a sign not to believers, Paul says, but to unbelievers. Now, people take that and they think, like, oh, yeah, it's a sign to unbelievers. Like, when I say shambhala, humbala, dumbala, like that, that it's a sign to unbelievers that something really spiritual is happening to me. And don't you want to have that too? That's not what the sign is to unbelievers. The sign to unbelievers was that God is now proclaiming the mystery of his truth to all of the other nations of the whole world in their own tongues and languages. That's the whole point of it. That's the whole point of it. And that God... You know, I, I don't like this. I don't like the idea that some people have that the church is some kind of parentheses because, because it's not. The Lord knew from all eternity uh, about his creation of the church, that the gospel would go to the nations, that the gospel would be proclaimed in other tongues. Um, he, it's in the text 700 years before Christ walked the earth. It's right there in Isaiah. And... And I think that in Matthew 23, and other places too, but in Matthew 23, we start to see the reason why. The hardness of the leaders of Israel's hearts against the Lord was used by God to proclaim his mysteries to the ends of the earth. And I, I would even say, so two more things really quick. I know it's not a topic of our text, but I, just because it's a tertiary point. Um, I would even say that that's how we know tongues ended in, after the apostolic era is because that the church was already established in foreign lands that spoke the Bible is written and the New Testament is written in Greek. It's not written in Hebrew, it's written in Greek. I believe also in fulfillment of what Isaiah 28 is talking about. And, um, and that's also the fact of why you know, we're, we're reading it in English right now. Because we're on the other side of the world and God is, is speaking in other languages 
even to heathens in Arlington Heights, Illinois. <laughs> you know, it's really, really remarkable, really beautiful and, and amazing. Anyway, but we see the reason for it. The reason for it is because what the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sanhedrin and the, what those people were called to was to be a light to the nations. They were called to that. But instead of being a light to the nations, when they made proselytes, they didn't convert them to the way of God. They converted them to the way of their own perverted mess and wretched religion, which was not true at all. And so the Lord, in essence, well, Jesus says so in his parables, takes the kingdom away <coughs> from those leaders and gives it to someone else. You can see in just these three woes, not only how deserving the scribes and Pharisees were of their own condemnation, but also why these words are recorded during the final week of Jesus' earthly life and ministry. By calling these men out for their hypocrisy and evil, Jesus was signing his own death warrant. Nevertheless, this chapter of Matthew's gospel serves as a warning to all of us, doesn't it, that, that we should never devour widows' houses, that we should never make long prayers for a pretense. I was convicted by that too. I mean, just the fact of how often they're, you know, we're in church and might, there might be some long prayer. Now, I'm not saying prayer for a long time is bad, but prayer for a pretense is bad. And long prayer for a pretense is even worse. <laughs> it's, just, it's just adding you know, to the badness of it. Let's make our communication to God true and pure and simple. And when we seek to make proselytes to the Christian faith, to to make converts, which is what Christ actually does call us to do, go and make disciples to all nations, that we do so with the right motive, that we do so never to pad the numbers of our church, never to pad the numbers of our budget, but only and always because we care about the souls of those who are lost, and we want them to meet the Lord Jesus Christ, and we want them to have salvation in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, um, thank you for these difficult lessons from Matthew 23. Pray that you make application of these things to our lives. I ask that, just that, even as we go through, and there's five more left to go through of the woes. And even though they're difficult, and they're difficult to prepare and difficult to even to listen to, that you would use these words uh, for our own spiritual benefit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One ninety-five. All right. Hymn number 195. Hmm. Amen. They are. Oh, this, you picked this one because it's my favorite. So, <laughs> let's stand and sing Wonderful Words of Life.
to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. May God be with you all.